Good morning, I am Linda Burke, Vice President of the Docent Council, a volunteer group at the Nevada Historical Society, Nevada's oldest cultural institution, located on the campus of the University of Nevada, Reno, now open to the public Wednesdays and on Thursday and Friday by appointment. Please visit our website, nevadahistoricalsociety.org for more details. Thank you for joining us for this last session of History Talks at the Nevada Historical Society in association with Art Town. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Sam Macaluso. Sam is a native Nevadan born and raised in Reno and Sparks. He has been a banker, a teacher, and a Nevada Air National Guardsman. His passion is Nevada history. And so although he has taught third through sixth grades, Fourth grade is his favorite because he could focus on Nevada. Sam is the past president of the Docent Council at the Nevada Historical Society. He is also the recent recipient of the Marjorie Fordham Award for outstanding service given by the Docent Council at the Nevada Historical Society. Today, Sam will speak on the first and last in Nevada, the notorious, should be exciting, enjoy. Well, welcome everybody. Yeah, we're gonna talk about some of the first and last in Nevada, some of the notorious people, uh, things, you know, criminals that have set, might say they set a precedent here in Nevada. Um, it's interesting because there's a lot of things that, you know, that are, are not well known about what took place. And I'm gonna start right off the bat with these two guys, Jack Davis and John Squires, or Squeers. It's actually Squires, it's misspelled in the slide there. But anyway, these two men are the, are the two ringleaders that pulled off the Verdi train robbery. And the Verdi train robbery was actually the first transcontinental train robbery in US history. Now, it's not the first train robbery because back in 1868, the Reno brothers, and they're no relation to Marcus Reno or Janet Reno or any, you know, with, with dealing with Custer or um, later on. But they actually robbed a train in Nebraska. And it was a spur train, though. It wasn't part of the Transcontinental Railroad. This in Nevada was, was the first Transcontinental Railroad robbery that happened on, you know, the Western United States. And it turned out that uh, Jack Davis, he was uh, pretty well known. He was actually um, lived in, in Virginia City and he was a really very well respected businessman. He taught Sunday school, everybody knew him. Um, he was just this really quote, nice guy. He was a superintendent of a, of a mine there in Virginia City. But the other thing they didn't know about was he was the ringleader of the gang. And what they did was they would rob these orc um, wagons uh, from other mines, and then he would take it into his mine, which basically had, uh, you know, no, it, there was basically no gold or silver in it. And what he'd do is he'd take these uh, wagons that he robbed and crush the ore and make his own bars. And then he would, you know, he would sell it, you know, his, he would sell them. And he, that's how he was making his money. It turned out that none of his shipments were ever held up, coincidentally. But he decided to turn his attention to bigger game. And the railroad was the big game. So on November 4th in 1870, um, he got a coded message. And the message said, send me $60 and charge my account. And it was signed J. Enrique. And what that meant is that the Union Pacific Railroad was going to be coming down through Reno on its way east. And so Jack Davis and Squires and several other members of his gang uh, set up a, a, rob a robbery scheme. And what they did is they um, in Verdi, as the train was coming in, and it was supposed to be there at about 10 o'clock at night, but there was a delay on the tracks. The, tra the train didn't show up until um, 
about midnight. So midnight on November 4th, uh, the train shows up. It slows down in Verdi and never stopped. And some men got on the train. Several got into the, to the passenger cars and two men jumped in the uh, engineer's car and they held the engineer and the fireman uh, both with pistols, put pistols at their head, told them to slow the train down and give a, a prearranged signal that they had taken over the train. Um, later, right after that, uh, the people that were in the back disconnected the passenger cars so that only the engine and the coal car and a box car uh, was left. They took it on a spur down to where, um, it's basically in Mayberry in the industrial park. That's where the actual robbery took place, was in the industrial area, just outside of that lot in Hot Springs that you see if you go down the old Highway uh, 80 or Highway 40 that was just sold. It was a big deal about it in the paper that they just sold it. But that was right in that area is where the train actually was robbed. And what they did was they took the two, the engineer and the coal, uh, the, the stoker, the fireman, and they took them to the boxcar, knocked on the door, and the guard said, what do you want? And they said, open the door right now. And so when he opened the door, he was looking at three shotguns. And so they went in, told them to sit down in a corner, and they did. And they proceeded to rob the train of $41,000 in gold double eagles. And the funny thing is, not only was there gold uh, double eagles, which are $20 gold pieces, but they left all the silver bars in the currency because they said, well, silver, the silver bars were too heavy to carry. And the currency, they said, well, nobody wants currency. So they just left the currency. And anyway, they took off uh, around Lawton Lot, Lot Hot Springs. There was someone there waiting with horses. Uh, supposedly they divided up the money as best they could and rode off. And the train finally comes into Reno, re reconnects the train. They reconnected the train. It gets into Reno after one o'clock in the morning. Um, and they let everybody know. They wake up the sheriff and the deputies and they let everybody know what's, what went on. So the governor, Wells Fargo, and the post office all put up rewards. And the reward was about $35,000. And we're talking $35,000 in 1870 money. So you, what you do is you take that and multiply it times about 25, and that'll give you today's value. So that was quite a hefty reward for the capture of these men. Well, the deputy sheriff of, of Reno, his name was Jim Kinghead. He formed a posse, and they tracked him down, uh, a couple of the people, they tracked him down in uh, California, right around Quincy. And, you know, if you ever watch these TV shows, you know, they capture a criminal and they say, okay, who's the ringleader? Who's the rest of your gang? And the guy goes, I'm not talking. You can't make me talk and all this. Well, that didn't happen. As soon as they rounded up some of the, you know, a couple of the people, they couldn't stop talking. And they told them who the, the ringleaders were, Jack Davis and John Squires, that were the ringleaders. And I mean, they told them everything. They even told them where to find them. So sure enough, Squire uh, Davis gets um, arrested in Virginia City. He's just walking the streets of Virginia City. And the thing is, is they, they recovered all but $3,000 of the money and they figure that that $3,000 was buried somewhere. Now, some people say it's buried along the tracks around where uh, Boomtown is. And, you know, between there and Lawton Hot Springs. Uh, some say that um, Davis took it up to um, uh, Virginia City, melted it down and made it into bars. Uh, some say that he he buried it in Virginia City. So we don't know whatever happened to those $3,000 in $20 gold pieces. They were never found. Anyway, these criminals got varied sentences anywhere from 14 to 21 years based on their participation in the robbery. Uh, Davis himself got 10 years, but he was paroled after four. And he was paroled because of good behavior. So what does he do? He goes 
east in eastern Nevada and around in Eureka County and starts robbing stagecoaches. But that's where he met his demise because uh, the way they would signal was one fire, there were no shotgun riders. If there were two fires, that meant a shotgun rider came with the stage. Well, the uh, accomplice built two fires. The problem was he had them so close together that Davis thought it was only one fire. So he went to hold up a stage and proceeded to be killed by the shotgun guard who filled him full of lead with his double barrel shotgun. And so that ended Jack Davis and and that. But it's the first time a train was robbed um, in Nevada or transcontinental train. The interesting thing too is as it was headed east, it was robbed again. It was robbed right near the Utah-Nevada border. The problem was they didn't get any money because the, the, this money that, that uh, was stolen was supposed to go to um, the uh, miners up in Virginia City. It was their pay. And so the train was basically had no money on it when it was robbed a second time um, later on, you know, within a few days after this robbery took place. So it has that dubious distinction. Okay, now we have this gentleman. This gentleman, his name is G. John. And G. John has the the dubious distinction of being the first person to be killed in the gas chamber. Uh, The thing is, is he was a, a gang member in uh, Chinatown in San Francisco. And he was also um, kind of like one of their top assassins. And he was told to kill a person in Nevada. He was given a contract to kill this man in Nevada. So he comes to Mina, Nevada of all places. If you've ever been through Mina, there's not much left of Mina. Uh, He met his quarry, which was a 74, four-year-old man who was named Tom Key. Anyway, he uh, watched him for a while. And then what he did is he just walked up, knocked on the door of his house. And when this Tom Key opened the door, he was shot several times and killed by this guy here, who was G. John. Well, the trial happened and it was quite a quick trial. And And in those days, they decided hanging was too much of a cruel and unusual punishment. So we're going to try out this new thing, killing him with gas. How did they do it? Well, the first time they did it, they, you know, they had gotten, I mean, this happened around um, 1922. So it was after the First World War. So, you know, during the First World War, gas was used on the trenches. So they had some of this cyanide gas. And when John G was, uh, or when G John was sleeping, they threw some of those cylinders under there in his in his cell and figured that would be the end of G John. Well, you know, the cells were wide open, the window, you know, the bars on the windows wide open, and so all the gas dissipated out the windows, and he wakes up and he's perfectly fine. So they didn't kill him the first time. So then they said, okay, so there, what are we going to do next? So they had, there was an old butcher block house and they said, well, this is where maybe we can, we can do it in there. So the story goes that they, they threw in some cyanide tablets and two birds to see what would happen. Well, there were so many leaks in this block in this, in this butcher block house that when they opened the door, the birds flew away. But at least they knew now where the leaks were. So they patched up all the leaks and they put in a window so that you know people could observe the uh, execution. And so here it is. This is this is where they did it. Here's you know they had this is just pictures, but this is the window where they could view uh, G. John being executed by lethal gas. Okay, so it was February of 19, February morning, 1922, February 8th. He gets strapped in this chair. They put in the cylinders of of, uh, gas. There's only one small problem. 
the gas for it to work had to be at 70 degrees and the temperature in this place was 58 degrees. So all the gas puddled up in the bottom here. It puddled up as, as liquid and didn't diffuse until after this got warmed up. So anyway, he sat in the chair for a while. Uh, they figure at least 30 minutes. He just sat in the chair. And then finally, after about 30 minutes, enough of the gas had, had, va had vaporized. And he just basically just turned his head and, and didn't move. Well, in the meantime, there obviously was a leak because some of the observers, the witnesses, could smell an almond smell. And the almond smell was from the gas. That's how you could tell because the gas is odorless. So they had to put a smell in there. So they used almond scent. And anyway, um, the, they go, we better evacuate here or we're all going to be dead. So they evacuated the, the, where they witnessed this execution and basically left him in there for another two or three hours until all the gas had dissipated. So when they opened it up finally, after they, they blew out the gas that was left, and then finally after about three hours, they took him out. Yes, he was dead. And that was it, the first gas chamber execution. After that, a gas chamber was actually built. And we know that, you know, several people were, have been killed. And also I, I found who the last person was. The last person executed in the gas chamber in Nevada was a guy by the name of Richard Allen Moran on March 30th, 1996. And he actually took his case. It was Moran v. Gottenez to the Supreme Court because apparently what he did was he first said that he was innocent. And then later, without benefit of counsel, changed his story and said, no, he was guilty of killing all, there were several people that he killed and he was guilty of killing them all. And so he was sentenced to the gas chamber. Well, he took the, his case to the Supreme Court saying that he should have had counsel. And the Supreme Court ruled against him and said, if a competent person stands trial and pleads guilty, they waive their rights to right, they waive their rights to the, uh, for counsel which is interesting. I didn't even know that until I, I just researched this a couple of days ago and found that. So if you declare yourself guilty, you may not be able to have counsel defending you. But anyway, that was the last person. So G. John was the first. Moran was the last. Now we go to this lovely lady. This is Elizabeth Potts. June 20th, 1890 in Elko, Nevada, she became the first woman, the first and actually last woman ever hung in the state of Nevada. And the thing goes is she was working in Carlin, January of 1888, with her husband, Josiah. They had two children. Uh, Josiah worked for the uh, railroad in Carlin. And she became friends, well, her family, the family became friends with this guy named Miles Fawcett. And he was a wealthy, older horse trader. But he was pretty wealthy, and what he did was she would um, do his laundry, and she would cook for him, and he would pay her. Well, in later on in that year, January of 1888, he all of a sudden disappears, and he's never seen again. Witnesses said he went to the uh, house of the of Elizabeth and Josiah Potts, and never came out. Later on, the Potts's are uh, driving around in his wagon. And they, people asked, they said, well, how did you get this wagon? This belonged to Miles Fawcett. And they said, oh, he uh, sold it to us. And they produced what they, what was a, you know, a bill of sale, allegedly signed by him. Um, so later on that year, they pack up and move to uh, Wyoming. And a, a person, John uh, George Brewer, and his wife move into the Potts house. Well, George Brewer worked for the Elko Free Press. And all of a sudden, things started happening in that house, and there was a ghost. 
and things would rattle around and, you know, you'd hear stomping and, you know, they, they, uh, you know, he talked about how this, they, they had a ghost living in their house. Well, pretty soon the ghost got a little belligerent and he started knocking things down. They had, you know, food that was canned and he just knocked it off the shelves and broke all their, you know, the food uh, that they had canned and prepared, uh, tipped over things, made all kinds of racket to the point where finally the brewers decided, well, we better go down in the cellar and see what's going on down there. So when they go down there, you know, amidst all the trash, they find this burned body and in the pocket is a, is a, a, a folding knife that has the initials of um, MF, Miles Fawcett. So they knew that Miles Fawcett had been killed in that house and this was his ghost trying to, to tell them what was going on. In February of 1889, the Potses, who are still in Wyoming, get arrested for the murder of Miles Fawcett and they're returned back to Elko. And in their defense, Mrs. Fawcett said that, um, or Mrs. Potts said that Fawcett killed himself. And that since he killed himself, they didn't know what to do. So they, they uh, hid the body. They tried to burn it and uh, hid the body down in the cellar. And allegedly, um, you know, he, had molested one of their children and, and she was a six-year-old girl. They had a 12-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl. Uh, and supposedly that's what he did. And then he, you know, he was so grieved that he killed himself. But the jury saw otherwise and found both Josiah and uh, Elizabeth Potts guilty of first degree murder. The two kids were then shipped off to foster parents. One adopted, the boy was adopted in Oregon. The girl was adopted in Elko. But uh, they were sentenced to be hung. So they built, they actually built the gallows in Placerville. Once they built it, they took it apart and shipped it to Elko. And then the sheriff issued these. He issued tickets because what they did is in the, in the yard, they put up this 10 foot tall fence so that no one could witness the execution of Josiah and Elizabeth Potts. Well, people still would climb on any, any place they could to do it, but there were 52 of these given out. This was your ticket to get in to see the execution. And sure enough, Elizabeth Potts and her husband, um, well, what she tried to do was the, the day of the funeral, she tried to slit her wrists and, and kill herself, but that didn't work because one of the deputies who was on, on uh, watch saw what was happening and was able to uh, prevent that. So her and her husband go out to the gallows and sure enough, on June 20th, 1890, they're, they're hung. And there was a um, reporter from the San Francisco Daily Report and he said as follows, it is to the credit of Elko, Nevada that it hangs a woman guilty of murder. It is a dreadful thing to hang a woman but not so dreadful as for a woman to be a murderer. Evidently, Elko possesses citizens who, when on a jury, have some respect for their oath. In San Francisco, Mrs. Potts would have certainly either been acquitted or pronounced insane and would have walked out the court a free woman. So see, we, we don't fool around here in Nevada. We just, we just string them up. This guy, his name is Andriza Merkovic. And Andriza Merkovic, he was a Siberian immigrant and um, he committed a crime in, it was about 1912. What he did was his uh, cousin died in a fire in a mine um, in Virginia City. And when he, he was the only heir and when he was given his settlement, he believed that the lawyer cheated him out of his due share of, you know, settlement for, you know, his, his cousin being killed. And so he proceeds to shoot the lawyer and kill the lawyer. Well, okay, so they said, all right, um, 
again, they hadn't done gas chamber. They said, well, hanging, we don't want to do that. That's, you know, we want to try this new technology firing squad. So this man is the first person to ever be the first and only person to ever be executed by a firing squad. And so he gets, you know, the thing is supposed to work and it works perfectly. And here's what it looked like. We don't have a picture. They never did take a picture, a photograph of what they called the killing machine. And this is what it was. These are three uh, 30, 30 caliber rifles. Um, he is strapped, you can't really tell, you can kind of see the straps on the side of this chair here. He's strapped in, these rifles are aimed directly at his chest. Three men are behind there and two of the rifles are loaded with live ammunition and the other one is loaded with blank ammunition. So the, the person never knows who um, was the actual, you know, who actually killed this man. And then what they would do is they would get behind this gun when they had a, a string and then at the prescribed time, they all pull the string at the same time and the rifles would discharge. And sure enough, March 14th, 1913, the rifles discharged and two of the bullets got him square in the heart and Mikovic was dead, Merkovic was dead. Um, this is made out of metal. It, it weighed well over a thousand pounds. And it was the only time this was ever used to kill anybody. After that, it was stuck in the back of the prison. And in, in, uh, during World War II, it was actually cut up for scraps because it was metal. Now, the three rifles are supposedly in the um, historical society in Carson, in the, the, the Carson City Museum. They're in the museum in Carson City. So if you ever go there, you might ask, about where the, the rifles are that, you know, from the killing machine that killed uh, Merkovic. So first and only man ever killed by a uh, firing squad. This is an interesting because there's a book and I read, I read the book called about Shoshone Mike. Shoshone Mike was a um, Native American and he, um, and his family basically left the reservation and were um, basically nomadic, traveled around. There were like 12 to 15 people in, the, um, in his family and they traveled around, but Shoshone Mike was kind of a bad person. I mean, he did what he had to do. So they would steal cattle and they would steal sheep and they would you know, um, do whatever they could to, to survive. Well, it turned out that in uh, early 1911, February, four men were discovered up in Elko, or in Washoe County, up, up above Gerlach. They were four sheep herders. And they were basically, their bodies were, were mutilated. They were killed, mutilated. Um, weapons taken, everything basically stripped off their body. So they were left there and they figured it was Shoshone Mike and his group of people that did this because Shoshone Mike was just in that area um, very recently before this happened. And apparently what happened is these men um, surprised them as they were killing, uh, uh, illegally taking these animals and when they confronted them, they were killed and mutilated. So the posse takes off after them. A posse is, is arranged. There's about 20 men in this posse um, and they take off after them. And this is just outside of Golconda. It's right on the, on the border of Humboldt and Elko counties. And they caught up with them in March of 1911 in, um, Basically, they were in a gully. Uh, allegedly, the marshal who was with them asked them to surrender. And they would not surrender. Instead, they put up a fight. Uh, 
they were outgunned, obviously. They, they had, between them, they had, um, it was estimated that they had uh, three or four hand, three or four guns of various types, a couple of handguns, a, a rifle and a shotgun, um, a few bow and arrows, but for the most part, they were pretty much unarmed. Plus the women and children didn't have any, any weapons at all. It was just the men. Um, the gunfight lasts about three hours. And when it's finished, uh, the only people that are left alive are one young girl and three babies, three really young children young, young children. And that's, and, and they're taken to um, Elko. And through an interpreter, yes, they confessed to the fact the girl confessed that they in fact had murdered those four people and, um, you know, had made off because because the, the children were basically dressed in their clothes in these people's clothes that were, had been cut down, and whatever. And so, you know, only one um, man was killed. His name was Ed Hogel. He was a deputy. He was killed. He was killed by the last shot uh, that the, uh, that they had in their in their weapons, and it was a revolver. And what happened is a young um, a young boy hid under his mother's uh, coattails or skirt, and when the uh, deputy came up to grab the mother he jumped out from un underneath her skirt and shot him and killed him. And both of them ended up being killed under a hail of bullets, it was said. So this is considered the last uh, Indian massacre that happened in the United States. This is after Wounded Knee. It was in 1911. And so this is the last uh, Indian massacre that's taken place in the state of Nevada. This is Nevada Redwood, who's hanging here on this telephone pole. And at the turn of the century, and it happened around 1905, 1905 is when it took place, um, in the town of Hazen. Hazen was a, a railroad stop, plus it was also um, one of the construction activities for the Newlands Project that was being put in. And that the Newlands Project is where they diverted some of the Truckee River um, in canals and deposited it in uh, Lake Lahontan. And so this was one of the stations where this was one of the locations where they had the headquarters of uh, a construction site, plus there was a railroad spur there. The problem with Hazen was they really didn't have any law and order there. The constable was in Fallon, and Fallon is about 15 miles, 20 miles away from Hazen. And that was the only law that, that prevailed at the time. So it attracted a bunch of no goods. And one of those no goods was this guy here, Nevada Redwood. And the thing was, is he had just uh, been uh, released from Sing Sing prison in New York. And he makes his way to Reno in January of 1905, uh, holds up a uh, man, but apparently the victim was coerced to the point where he would not bring charges against Nevada Redwood. And so he was, they were never charged with the crime. But Wood decides he's going to move on, you know, uh, Reno's a little too hot for him because Reno's a pretty big town, see, in 1905. But Hazen isn't. So he moves to Hazen and he, he tries to rob one of the canal workers and he gets captured and thrown into this shack here that you see in the background. And they lock the door and they call Judd Allen from Elko or from, excuse me, from Fallon and say, hey, get over here because we, locked up this guy. He was trying to rob one of our workers. Okay, so Judd Allen shows up and, you know, they put him in this shack. And that night when Judd Allen goes, you know, back to, he goes to a hotel here, um, vigilantes break into this thing, grab Nevada Redwood, throw this rope over this telephone pole and proceed to string him up. The next morning, they look out there, and it's March 1st, 1905, 
Judd Allen looks out there and he thinks this is a dummy and really doesn't realize that this is this prisoner that got strung up the night before or early that morning by a vigilante group. So anyway, they finally figure out this guy's a legitimate corpse and they cut him down. And when the justice of the peace uh, did the autopsy and the inquest, it said, here's what he said. He said, Wood came to his end by being hung to a telephone pole with a rope, of, with a rope around his neck. Pretty obvious. Well, at the same time, what was going on was the Nevada legislature was meeting. So after he's taken down, after this goes off, the Nevada legislature makes a trip to Hazen to, to see, you know, what took place. And anyway, they, they proceed to um, start, get a, introduce a bill to condemn hangings, regardless if it's a hanging of a person that's been uh, you know, arrested and convicted or a vigilante hanging like this. So they basically outlawed hanging is what it, what it meant. That's why we have those other two characters, one being shot with a, a, a firing squad and the other being gassed, okay? Well, there was a young boy there and the young boy who lived in Hazen said, well, can I have the rope? that hung red wood. And they said, yeah, sure, go ahead, take it. And so anyway, um, this kid gets a rope. He cut off about a one foot piece, nailed it to a board, put a little sign. This is the rope that hung red wood. And he sold it for 50 cents. Well, they, people bought, bought it like crazy, okay? So pretty soon he's out of rope. So what does he do? Well, he goes to the local mercantile and buys all the rope they have there. Cuts off a one foot piece, nails it to a board, says this is the rope that hung red woods. And apparently the story goes that there was enough rope to hang everyone in the state of Nevada by the time this kid got finished. But he made a sizable amount of money. And there are people that still have these, you know, some of the old, old folks and, and you know, it's been passed down in Fallon that have this little plaque that says this is the rope that hung red woods and there's no way to tell if it's legitimate or not. But the kid made off good. So anyway, that was it. The last vigilante hanging that took place in Nevada. This is actually a first and a last happened up in Jarbage. This is the jail. Um, it was the last recorded stage uh, stagecoach robbery in US history. And it took place in December of 1916 in Jarbridge, Nevada, which if, is well north of Elko, uh, near the Idaho border. On December 5th of 1916, the stage, which was bringing in the mail and it also had uh, money there from, um, you know, to pay miners, because this was a mining town. This was just, a, it was a mining town. There was a lot of they found gold and silver was discovered there. Anyway, the, the stage was three hours late. It was a bad night. They said it was, you know, blizzard-like conditions. So the weather was not that, uh, could, you know, very good. Um, snow and everything else. So they sent out a, a rider looking for this stage coach and they couldn't find it. But they did run into this lady, uh, Mrs. Dexter, who lived a mile, about half a mile from the post office. And she said that she had seen the, the stage go by about three or four hours earlier. And she had waved to the driver and the driver waved back and she didn't see anything wrong. Okay. So anyway, they form a search party and sure enough, they find the missing coach and the driver, his name was Frank Searcy. They found first class um, mail. They found the mail pouch. But the money was missing. It was like $4,000 in coin, and it was missing. The next day, the weather, I guess, is better. So they, they go back to where they found the pouch, and they find um, footprints. There's a dog there, an old dog. And they find these uh, letters that have, that's, have blood smeared all over them. Basically, it was the dog that caught the, the, the robber because the dog... They, they tell the dog, go home, go home. So he, 
they follow the dog, and sure enough, he comes up to this guy. His name is Ben Cole. And they go through Ben Cole's place, and they find bloody clothes. They find the, a pistol that has one shot uh, expended. And it turns out it was the same shot that shot Cersei in the back of the head. And um, they had a shirt, a coat, revolver, and all kinds of other things. So he's arrested, thrown into that jail that you see right there, and he waits trial. The trial happens in Elko in September of 1917, so almost two years later. And they used this. These are palm prints. These are his palm prints off of the letter, off of the bloody letters that they found. It's the first time in US history palm prints were used to convict a criminal. And the interesting thing is it went to the state Supreme Court. It was state versus cull, and the state Supreme Court upheld this as legitimate evidence to convict a criminal. So he was convicted because of bloody palm prints. So he was sentenced to death, but um, he has an appeal on, on January 10th of 1918. And in this appeal, he um, talks about, he says, well, wait a minute. He said, actually it was, we both conspired to rob the stage. And then Cersei double-crossed me, and so I shot him in self-defense. So he was, instead of a death sentence, he was convicted to life imprisonment. Um, he was released in 1945 because he had contracted tuberculosis and he was dying. So basically they let him out, and he died within about a month after he got out of prison. Um, and the thing is that the money up in Jarbage was never recovered. They don't know if there were accomplices. Uh, they don't know if he buried the money someplace and they just have never found it. Uh, they, there's been people that have gone up to sea, but no one's ever uh, been able to find uh, any trace of that $4,000 that was, law, that was uh, gotten from the robbery. But again, he's the last, the last stagecoach robbery and the first time palm prints had ever been used to convict a criminal. And that's basically the end of my talk. Thank you, Sam. Very interesting. I have a few questions here. Why was um, Red Wood called um, Nevada Red Wood? Why was he? Well, I mean, that was just a nickname that he got. He got that nickname when he came here and he robbed that, uh, he robbed the uh, person. It, it was actually Red Wood. Red, Red was yeah. his first name. And, you know, then they just stuck Nevada in front of it when he came here but yeah he was really redwood and uh, so he was redwood in new york yeah, he was redwood okay. when he was in sing sing prison yeah okay. okay good all right and then um kristen asks have you ever gone looking for the lost loot from the verdi train robbery? no now they have people have gone and looked for it now you have to understand too okay we're talking 1870 the Transcontinental Railroad was finished the year before, okay? And actually it was about 18 months before. They realigned the tracks. So this is why no one's been able to find it because they, they realigned the tracks and they're not sure if that's where it is. And again, there's been stories that um, they it's buried somewhere around where that hot springs uh, place is that was just sold. There's stories that, that Davis took it to Verdi or to Virginia City and melted them down, melted the coins down and put them into gold bars. So, you know, uh, to, to get rid of the evidence. Um, there's other things that he buried it in Six Mile Canyon around Verdi or Virginia City. So, you know, there's, there's different stories and it's just, it, it just never, you know, because it never turned up, you know, they, you have these gold seekers. More people have actually gone up and looked in garbage mm. than they have out in, in, along the railroad tracks and up in Virginia City. There's actually been more uh, treasure hunters looking there. 
And they haven't found that $3,000 or $4,000 either. They haven't found that either. They don't know where, where he could have done it. And that's why they think, well, maybe there was an accomplice that took the money or somebody that was rooming with, with Ben Cole. And when he got arrested, this guy figures, well, I'm just going to take off with the money. And then, you know, that was that. So it's, it's hard to say. Right. I, I was surprised to hear that uh, Stagecoach was running in 1916. Yeah. How, how long did the Stagecoach run? It, was, it wasn't much after that. And actually, the, it, it, here's the distinction. A Stagecoach handles passengers. Okay, it's a coach that handles passengers. This was more, it could handle a couple of people but it was more of a boxed in thing that held mail and freight and things like that going up to garbage. But yeah, it was it, because it was taken by horses and could accommodate passengers, it was considered a stagecoach okay. as opposed to a wagon. How many women were hung in Nevada? Just the one. For the gas chamber, how many people were killed by in the gas, in gas chamber? Only um, that person? I looked it up. There were, I think, in excess of 40 um, oh, wow. people. Now they do lethal injection. And as, as you notice, I mean, it's been in the paper. And it was funny because in the paper, the, the person that's on death row now that is supposed to, you know, and they've, they've postponed it several times because they can't get the, the, the quote, cocktail that, you know, they won't sell it to them in, in, Las, in Los Angeles. Um, or in California, they won't sell them the, the ingredients to make this lethal cocktail to kill the guy. He, he said, well, I want to be, I want to be uh, shot with a firing squad. And they said, you can't because that's been outlawed. We only did it once and it's been outlawed. So he, he can't be killed with a firing squad. You know, the same thing happened with G. John. They couldn't find cyanide. And so it turned out that the governor of Nevada drove to California and picked up 400 pounds of cyanide to bring back with him so they could try this out. And it took three times because the first time they just threw it in the cell. Well, that didn't work. The second time they threw it in with a couple birds, but there was so many uh, yeah. leaks in the thing that the birds just <laughs> flew out when they opened the door. And then finally, the third time, they did it and then they just left, they left him there for about three or four hours. I know that there have been Supreme Court cases where somebody has been put in an electric chair and they throw the handle and it doesn't work. Now, does that mean the person's been executed? Yeah. And it's actually gone to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, you know, says, well, you know, it, it depends on the circumstances. Let's say there was a power failure or something, you know. And that's one thing. But if they throw the handle and then nothing happens, has the person been executed? Can you, ex can you do it a second time or does that could constitute double jeopardy? Okay, Sam. Well, I think we'll leave it at there. No more questions. Okay. Thank you very much for oh, a very welcome. interesting, fascinating <laughs> yeah. subject. <laughs> very nice. And thank you to Carol, too, for all the yeah. behind the work scenes during these sessions. And Goodbye, everybody. Thank you and for all attending. The other, yeah, and everybody that attended is good. That's good. Yes, I, yes. Very nice. So. Pretty nice. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. All right. Bye now.